from CNN headquarters in Atlanta, this is Headline News. I'm Laurie Bishop sitting in for Gordon Graham. Some New Jersey residents are fighting to keep sex offenders out of their neighborhoods. On Saturday, they found out that the man who admits luring a seven-year-old girl into his house assaulted her, strangled her. He had served six years for attempting to assault another child. Mark Leff has more on the story. A New Jersey neighborhood is now in shock and mourning. My daughter went to school with Megan, and it could have been any of our children. She was just one vulnerable little baby that somebody took advantage at the wrong time. Seven-year-old Megan Kanker knew the man who allegedly killed her. He lived across the street. What she and the neighborhood did not know is that 33-year-old Jesse Timondakwas, now charged with murder and sexual assault, had two prior sex convictions and shared the house with two other offenders he'd met in prison. Megan Kanker's death has prompted a petition drive. We, the undersigned, demand to know who lives in our neighborhood and should be informed about any convicted felons. And the first two signatures are Megan's parents. You get angry, but you don't know what to do about it. I think that getting these petitions together is, is the best thing we can do right now, but it's, it's an anger that you can't explain. We need to look at the whole panoply of laws that we have that cover sex offenders. A national victims' rights organization says about half the states now require convicted sex offenders to register with police. But while a Tennessee judge last year ordered a convicted child molester to post a sign in his front yard warning the neighborhood, the National Victim Center says no states have public notification laws, though Washington state lawmakers may pass one this year. When Joseph Gallardo got out of prison in Washington last year, somebody put up posters in his father's neighborhood, then burned down the house where Gallardo had planned to live. And when he moved to New Mexico to live with a brother, community pressure forced them both out of town. Gallardo returned to Seattle quietly a year ago to live with a sister. Some civil libertarians point out that convicted criminals who have served their sentences and are free of probation or parole restrictions have rights too, including the right to privacy. Arguments difficult for a grieving father to deal with. I can't understand how anybody can hurt, how anybody can hurt such a little girl like that. It's my little baby. She's gone forever. Nobody will ever be able to bring her back. Mark Leff, CNN, reporting. Federal marshals have taken positions outside dozens of abortion clinics nationwide, including both facilities in Pensacola, Florida. Dr. John Britton was shot to death at one of them Friday as he arrived for work. His unarmed volunteer escort was also killed. A police spokesman says Britton turned down an offer of protection six months ago because he felt he didn't need it. The clinic was where Britain was shot, and it has been closed indefinitely. Emotions are still running high in the city where Friday's attack took place. Who are you kidding? You killed doctors and you terrorists! We're all about. An anti-abortion activist held a news conference outside the Pensacola courthouse, but he was jeered by abortion rights demonstrators. The National Organization for Women held a rally in Pensacola last night, and about 150 supporters heard calls for more government action to end discrimination and violence against women. A Los Angeles police officer is threatening to sue O.J. Simpson and his lead attorney. Detective Mark Furman is demanding Robert Shapiro publicly apologize and retract the accusation that Furman planted a bloody glove at Simpson's estate the night his ex-wife and Ronald Goldman were murdered. Furman's lawyer calls the allegation false, libelous, and despicable. He says unless it is retracted, he'll file suit after Simpson's trial. Furman also plans to sue the New Yorker magazine, which first printed the claim. A Vermont man convicted of killing a teenage runaway who gave him a ride was executed this morning in Texas. Robert Drew always maintained his innocence and his convicted accomplice, who testified against him at trial, has since backed him up. But authorities refused to reopen the murder case. A man accused of killing his wife and letting their six-year-old son find the body has been convicted of mental assault. Edward Elliott was convicted yesterday under a provision of Ohio law that protects people who suffer mental illness as a result of crime. Elliott was sentenced to 10 to 17 years in prison. 
He was tried on aggravated murder charges in 1989, but the jury deadlocked on that. Congress has voted to stop funding school districts that teach acceptance of homosexuality. Senators yesterday followed in the footsteps of the House, adding the provision to a bill that distributes federal money to public schools. It cuts federal aid to districts that, quote, carry out a program or activity that has either the purpose or effect of encouraging or supporting homosexuality as a positive lifestyle alternative. That amendment passed by a vote of 63 to 36. Homosexuals in Canada are not permitted to adopt their partner's children, but they now have a means of financing what looks like it'll be a fierce, costly legal fight. Lorna Madelon reports. Tanya Gulliver on the right and her partner Louise Anderson live with Louise's two sons. Gulliver wants to adopt her partner's sons, but she can't. And I would like to be able to have the same rights that she has to them or that uh, any other partner she, that she could have would have if they were male. Gulliver and Anderson had pinned their hopes on the passage of a bill that would have granted homosexual couples the same legal rights as heterosexual couples. But that bill was defeated here at the provincial legislature and angry activists said they'd take their fight to the courts. This does not just affect gays and lesbians per se, it affects our children. Now they've taken the first step in that fight, creating a legal defense fund. Money will be collected through the Campaign for Equal Families, an umbrella group representing more than 30 gay and lesbian groups in Ontario. We will not give up the political side, but we also recognize that there are real people suffering real injustices right now. They need an answer. The only place they're going to get an answer for the time being is in court. It's an issue of civil rights in the 90s, and our charter is vastly outdated now. I'd like to adopt the boys and we'd like to be a legal family. Gays and lesbians have won court victories before on the grounds that the Charter of Rights and Freedoms prohibits discrimination based on sexual orientation. Now Gulliver and Anderson are hoping the courts will help them in their adoption fight the way some politicians were unwilling to. It's reminding people that the issue is not going to go away. Lauren Madel on CBC News, Toronto. The UN's High Commissioner for Refugees says conditions in refugee camps in Zaire will get better. The United Nations Children Fund estimates 50,000 Rwandans have died in camps over the past two weeks. But doctors have made some headway against the cholera epidemic with more fresh water and aid supplies. U.S. Defense Secretary William Perry said yesterday that only 3,000 U.S. troops will be needed in the aid effort instead of the 4,000 that he had predicted. The Dominican Republic has agreed to allow surveillance along its border with Haiti. The U.S. hopes that that will stop smugglers from getting fuel past an international naval blockade. Earlier yesterday, Haiti's de facto president, Emile Jonasson, enacted a state of siege hours after the U.N. Security Council approved a resolution authorizing the use of all means necessary to restore democracy to Haiti. On Capitol Hill, the Senate Banking Committee's Whitewater hearing put the Treasury Department's top lawyer on the hot seat. Gene Hansen testified until about midnight Eastern time about contacts between the department and the White House on Whitewater. Hansen says Deputy Treasury Secretary Roger Altman ordered her to brief a White House aide last fall about an investigation into an Arkansas savings and loan with ties to President and Mrs. Clinton. She defended that briefing. I am not a Beltway insider. I no preferential treatment or benefit was intended for anyone. And as far as I know, no one received preferential treatment. The President and First Lady were not the subject of any proposed governmental action. They were merely possible witnesses. Hansen's boss, Deputy Treasury Secretary Roger Altman, denies telling her to give information to the White House. Altman, along with Treasury Chief of Staff Joshua Steiner, are among those scheduled to testify before the committee today. Senate Majority Leader George Mitchell is expected to unveil his version of a health care reform bill today. It's expected to include universal coverage. President Clinton campaigned for health care reform in New Jersey yesterday, and he accused his opponents of spreading false information. And he said it's time for the U.S. to join other industrialized countries by providing universal health coverage. The president is scheduled to make another plea for health care reform during a news conference tomorrow night. The Big Apple may turn to plastic to help make ends meet. Brian Jenkins explains why. 
New York's economy has been looking up lately, but the city is still falling short in filling its budget gaps. The first Republican mayor here in 20 years is mulling one new way to pull in more money and might even have a slogan to suggest. Don't, don't leave New York without it or something like that? <laughs> no, not your wallet. Don't leave the city without your New York credit card. The Alumni Association of New York University offers its own card through a major credit card company, as do many other schools, sports franchises, and various nonprofit groups. Plano, Texas decided to try out an affinity card three years ago, issued by a local credit union with no financial risk for the city. There you go. There are now more than 650 Plano cards in circulation. Their use has brought the city $15,000. Here in South Orange, New Jersey, town officials were also looking for ways to use private enterprise in helping fill the public coffers. Village president William Calabrese noticed more and more customers at his pharmacy using affinity cards and wondered why the town shouldn't have one. You just can't keep on asking the taxpayer for more and more money. There's going to be revolt ultimately in this country. The village treasurer worked out a deal with an area bank for a credit card with no annual fee and a competitive interest rate. When the cards come out next month, the city will receive 1% of every purchase. Many locals love the idea. Why? Because I think it's good for the village, and it's good for me, and it's good for everybody. So good that in New York, Mayor Giuliani might propose separate credit cards for various city agencies, such as public housing or welfare. Whatever symbols go on the cards, the Statue of Liberty, the city skyline, a Big Apple, the MasterCard logo isn't likely to appear. MasterCard announced recently it is leaving the city, moving its staff to the suburbs. Brian Jenkins, CNN, New York. The rumor is apparently true. Lisa Marie Presley now says she did marry Michael Jackson in a private ceremony outside the United States 11 weeks ago. In a statement issued yesterday, Presley Jackson says the couple initially denied reports of their union in order to protect their privacy. And coming up just ahead in consumer news, the marketing of some soap operas may soon take a turn. And later... Tuning up for a musical return to Woodstock. Checking Tuesday's temperatures, warm weather will continue in the west with highs in the 90s and 100s in many areas. 80s will cover most of the rest of the country. This is Headline News, a CNN network. Nicotine gum and patches could be joined by a nicotine nasal spray. The FDA is debating whether to approve a pump bo a bottle holding pure nicotine. It's supposed to help smokers kick the smoking habit. Yesterday, an advisory committee told the FDA the spray could be easily abused and recommended that it only be available with a prescription. Today, the advisory committee will be asked to determine the level at which nicotine in cigarettes becomes addictive. Doctors are being advised to take their patients off an epilepsy drug called Felbitol. About 100,000 Americans use the medicine to prevent seizures. The Food and Drug Administration says nine Americans who took Felbitol contracted a rare form of anemia. Two of them died. The manufacturer, Carter Wallace, says patients should be taken off the medication immediately, except in cases where doctors judge sudden withdrawal symptoms would pose a greater risk than the drug itself. Daytime soap operas are feeling the heat from increasingly popular talk shows. Terry Keenan looks at how one major sponsor is trying to cover its losses. The Guiding Light. It's been 42 years since Procter & Gamble launched The Guiding Light, selling soap between scenes of sex and strife in small town life. <laughs> but today, with increased competition from talk shows, the soaps are under attack. P&G once produced seven soaps, that's now down to three. But the company is taking a new tact, aggressively merchandising its soaps to squeeze extra marketing mileage from the productions. I mean, it's been proven fact that there is a, a, there's a, a, a need and a want for this merchandise. Um, whether people buy it for themselves or if they buy it for their mother-in-law or a sister-in-law or a friend who's a real follower of it. 
What did I say to him? All I wanted was All to marry you. All I wanted was to marry you and whisk you off to some beach in Tahiti. Right now, the marriage of soaps and merchandise is limited to novelty items like T-shirts, hats, and Christmas ornaments. But P&G says jewelry and fragrances are not far behind. It's not like selling um, Seinfeld cereal bowls or Roseanne coffee mugs. This is products that really could appeal to people because they have an intimacy with their show. For years, uh, the fans have been desperate to get almost anything that has to do with the show. But a happy ending may not be so easy to produce. With viewers turning to more real-life programming, the soaps will need more than marketing to keep from being washed up. Terry Keenan, CNN Business News, New York. Mickey and Minnie Mouse are among the familiar faces adorning Japan Airlines' new Dream Express jumbo jet. JAL has also decorated two 767s with Disney characters. The airline is trying to upstage all Nippon Airways' popular marine jumbo, which is painted like a whale. The new look, including royalties to Disney, reportedly cost Japan Airlines more than three and a half million dollars. The Walt Disney Company says The Lion King has taken the throne as its highest grossing domestic film ever. The animated movie has earned nearly $219 million at American movie theaters. Disney's previous box office champ was Aladdin, which grossed $217 million. And Oriole reaches 2,000. Details are next in Headline Sports. This is Headline News, a CNN network. Anthony Keith James, Headline Sports. To the majors where Cal Ripken Jr. is the next Iron Man. Ripken Monday played in his 2000th straight game. He went 0 for 3, but pulled off his usual defensive gem in the field, helping the O's to a 1 0 win over the Twins. Only Lou Gehrig has played in more games, 2100. The Indians snapping their three-game losing skid with a 6-2 thumping of Detroit. Manny Ramirez and Paul Sorrento both launching two-run shots. Jason Grimsley winning his third straight decision, striking out eight. Cleveland a game and a half back of Chicago in the AL Central. To the scoreboard where Toronto splits a Monday twin bill with Boston. Mo Vaughn launching a two-run shot in the nightcap. Detroit falls to Cleveland. Kansas City topping Oakland. Brian McRae with a two-run blast. The Yankees stopping Milwaukee. And Minnesota falls to Baltimore. In the National League, the Expos pull it out in the 10th, 3-2 over the Cardinals. Marquise Grissom in the 10th played hero with a game-winning inside the Parker. Expos maintaining a three-and-a-half game lead over the Braves in the NL East. Elsewhere, the Giants fall to the Reds. Matt Williams with his 41st. Cards can't handle the Expos. Braves beat the Mets. Greg Maddox pitching his ninth complete game. Chicago stopping Florida. Colorado over Houston. Jeff Bagwell clubs his 37th. And the Padres topping the Dodgers. To the NBA, where the Celtics added 6'10 Purvis Ellison to their front line. The first player picked in the 89th NBA draft spent his last four seasons with the Washington Bullets. The Phoenix Suns traded veteran center Mark West to the Pistons for a pair of second-round draft picks. The trade clears the space under the salary cap for the Suns to sign free agent Danny Manning. To the Goodwill Games, where world champion Shannon Miller won two gold and two silver for the U.S. in the women's individual gymnastics in St. Petersburg. Miller captured the gold in the balance beam and floor exercise and took the silver in the vault and uneven bars. Anthony Keith James, Headline Sports. This is Headline News, a CNN network. The Rolling Stones have kicked off another world tour. The legendary band showed no sign of slowing down last night in Washington, D.C., the first stop of their 43-city tour. The Stones delivered their trademark sound for a full two hours and 20 minutes. 51-year-old Mick Jagger and his bandmates attracted a diverse crowd. Grew up with the Stones. Their heritage, their way of life. I mean, we're only 20 years old, but Rolling Stones are still in our generation as well as the generations before us. And yeah, the Rolling, no, the Rolling Stones keep getting better as they get older, and I like the old stuff as well as the new. The Rolling Stones are touring in support of their new album, Voodoo Lounge. Upstate New York is bracing for a music event the likes of which it hasn't seen since 1969. 
Mark Shearer has the latest on preparations for Woodstock 94. The 740-acre farm two hours north of Manhattan is already sprouting the signs of the small city it is to become for three days in mid-August. On this patch of land, a stage will rise that will host over 40 bands from the Red Hot Chili Peppers to Crosby, Stills & Nash. Water tanks are being filled, concession stands assembled, traffic routes mapped out, and security plans scrutinized in the wake of overseas terrorist bombings. Terrorists usually don't seek to kill kids as a way to win sympathy. So it's not, it's not a real target in our estimation, but you, 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 know, you do uh, take it into consideration. The promoters of the 1969 Woodstock Festival say they've sold 150,000 tickets to the 94 version and will try to sell the remaining 100,000 in smaller lots. We've been selling tickets by car only in groups of four, and as of this Monday, we're going to start selling in twos and threes as well. The nearby town of Saugerties, population 20,000, is braced for the influx of rock fans. It's going to be a zoo. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of traffic. It's a little town. Never seen anything like this. The designer of this T-shirt believes the festival 25 years ago was a grassroots anti-establishment statement. And it wasn't planned, right? This thing is overkill. It's institutional. It's manufactured. And it has no reason for being except somebody wants to make a lot of money. The legend of Woodstock is that it was a free show and that everybody just suddenly showed up in the middle of a field. Bands decided to come by and people decided to bring, you know, whatever they had at home, pieces of wood for the stage, maybe a speaker, you know, and put it in place. None of that, you know, is really how that happened. Duke Devlin came from Texas to the Woodstock Festival in 1969 and stayed. He's now on the Woodstock Ventures payroll. The times are different now, you know, but the, the spirit is, uh, I, I think it's caring for the, for the masses as a whole, that, that sense of community that we had in 1969 is, is slowly, slowly taking shape to, to appear here. Mark Shearer, CNN Entertainment News, New York. Coming up in the next half hour of headline news, tempers flare in the city that has become a focal point of abortion debate. President Clinton puts muscle behind his drive for health care reform. And an espionage bestseller unfolds on the silver screen. Those stories and more after a short break. I'm Laurie Bishop. A whole day's news every half hour. This is headline news. This is Headline News, a CNN network.